433, a program dedicated to new music on CITR at 101.9 FM in Vancouver. Now, this is a broadcast that was pre-recorded on Friday, November 29th, owing to a long-distance uh, conversation with a very special guest uh, based in Germany. Please allow me to welcome Mark Sabat uh, to uh, 433. Hey, Greg. Good to hear from you. So I wanted to introduce you a little bit, Mark. I wanted to say that uh, you have been a prolific composer who is originally based in Canada, but who has um, moved to Berlin and has lived there since 1999. While in North America, Mark received music instruction at the University of Toronto and the Juilliard School of Music. He has held residencies at the Banff Center for the Arts, the Academy Scholz Solitude in Stuttgart, the Herrenhaus Edenkoben, and the German Academy Villa Massimo in Rome. He has conducted many workshops on just intonation and has been a lecturer and visiting professor of composition at the California Institute of the Arts. In his compositions, Mark espouses a very complex theory of music, uh, which is entitled Just Intonation, but nevertheless, uh, his music resonates very strongly with people who hear it for the first time or who are very familiar with it. Mark has published, he composed many works for large and small ensembles and for computer, and has collaborated with video and performance artists and even with ballet performers. I also had the absolute privilege to collaborate with Mark in 2010 when he agreed to record a soundtrack for my film, The Theory of Happiness, which I hope we'll have a chance to chat about today. What is playing underneath me now is a piece by Mark Sabat called Claudius Ptolemy, and I will let you enjoy the remaining couple of minutes of it, and we'll be back to talk with Mark. What I really loved about this piece is that, despite being predominantly major, and correct me if I'm wrong, it has a certain t tonal ambivalence to it. You don't really know how to feel, necessarily, um, w whether it's major or minor. Well, I mean, one of the things which, which interests me, and I guess uh, uh, it interests me in particular in, in the music which I, which I love, whether it's Bach or James Tenney or... Uh, Lamont Young or Christian Wolf, uh, to name just a few uh, few names out of millions, or uh, Guillaume de Machaut, um, is is the way in which something which is uh, perhaps very conceptually or logically structured at its core can reach us through its sensual experience, through the phenomenon of sound, and uh, the way in which it sort of keys into a certain kind of listening, which maybe then. Um, echoes uh, a poetic feeling so it's not really a depiction or a kind of um, construction of feeling but rather the emergence of feeling from the sound itself that's what uh, I think really interests me and so the subject matter that uh, that you were interested in in the film which is um, the paradox of, of people trying to construct happiness by, by measuring it and therefore in a way kind of condemning themselves to a kind of um, 
unhappy existence. You know, I thought it was it was very poetic and beautiful and um, suitable. So, so the piece which uh, which uh, we ended up developing and using in the film, the Euler lattice spiral scenery, is uh, um, a recent string quartet that I wrote. Uh, I wrote in Rome in two thousand and eleven, uh, and in a way, it was kind of trying to deal with this question of um, how something through sound or through through kind of a, a almost a rigorous examination of sound could at the same time uh, echo something poetic and uh, uh, i think in that piece it it, uh, it also works quite well you know um i'm not sure if uh, if you were you thinking of playing some of that uh, for the radio audience i think that's a great idea i wanted to uh, preface this by uh, describing the setting in which it was recorded. So back in the summer of 2010 I was able to visit Berlin for three days where we had a kind of crash recording session. We drove to a little uh, 19th century church just outside of Berlin where we met uh, the members of the Sonar Quartet and at that time we weren't exactly sure about how the music would fit into the film so we recorded several pieces. The film, uh, by the way, for those who are curious, is about a radical Ukrainian sect that attempts to uncover a formula uh, for happiness through mathematical equations. In any case, what I found extremely impressive uh, in this sort of serene setting of our improvised recording studio was how uh, the musicians were able to handle a very taxing score. Now, besides the new system of notation that they had to learn, they also had to tune to each other at one-ninth of an interval between each note. Is that correct? Exactly. I, I mean, uh, just to kind of give a little background on that, it is a bit technical, but um, Leonhard Euler, who is a mathematician whose name appears in the title, was the person who first articulated the model of a harmonic lattice so that is the lattice in the title and namely that um, the kinds of harmonies that one knows in uh, in uh, in music particularly the european music starting with about the 13th century um, is based on um, combinations of the two or three most consonant intervals so the octave the fifth and the major third or the minor third depending on uh, how you consider it, how it's combined, and um, when when you actually look carefully at the tuning of these triads, they cannot be um, accurately reproduced by only the twelve notes on the piano, but they cause a kind of spiral of tuning when you connect one triad to the other, which is why, for example, when um, choirs sing, they often will change their basic pitch. It's not because they're not capable of keeping a pitch; it's rather because the natural flow of harmonies when they're connected one to the other can often cause a modulation by these very small commas. And the, the movement which is called Harmonium for Ben Johnston is based on this kind of um, triadic movement of major and minor tonalities, which in the end I think there's something like 99 different um, variations of pitch throughout, throughout the octave instead of the usual 12. Um, and uh, the, the piece is constructed as a series of spirals moving through the space, uh, starting from the, the tuning A and then coming back to it in a way. And this kind of uh, mathematical structure in the background is something which, when you listen to the music, you would, in a way, never, perhaps never expected that it really was made in that way. And so I was quite interested in a way in this paradox between something mathematical which then comes and reaches us quite quite beautifully and intuitively so i think that in that way it connects very much to your story and to the to the to these people who by taking their own happiness and then converting it back into mathematics end up finding nothing but uh, um, difficulties let's hear the second movement this is the harmonium for claude vivier is that right Yes, maybe I can just say a, a little bit about the, the, the form of the piece in brief. It does have five parts, and the two two main central parts are two harmonia, the, the one we talked about for Ben Johnson, and the one before it is harmonium for Claude Vivier, 
who is uh, a composer that also meant quite a lot to me growing up. And in this case, again, there is quite a mathematical background, which is namely that um, it's constructed of all the natural harmonics up to the ninth on all of the open strings and no other pitches at all. And um, when the quartet plays, they do quite a virtuoso act because they're only playing on the open strings and lightly touching them to produce uh, the overtones. And these overtones are organized in a kind of um, melodic form where you're uh, constantly hearing the slight variations and differences between the strings, but in a way where it is not presented simply as a, as a mathematical array, but rather as a long and kind of joyous uh, melody. This is the recording that we did for the film in August 2012. This is a harmonium for Claude Vivier, uh, the second movement of the earlier lattice spiral scenery. It is performed by the Sonar Quartet and uh, composed by Mark Sabat.
Welcome back. If you're just uh, tuning in, you're currently listening to 433, a program dedicated to new music. And today we have a very special long distance uh, conversation with Mark Sabat, who is talking to us from Berlin. Mark, I wanted to ask you to introduce another piece, uh, this one with a very evocative title called Harry Hippie Happy. Uh, the piece scored for three horns. Perhaps you can say a few words about it. Um, well, it was composed at the request of my friend and colleague Robin Hayward, who is a remarkable tubist based in Berlin. Some people who are followers of improvised music might have heard his incredible noise improvisations or his work with Jeff Intonation on the tuba. And in the early 2000s, after coming to Berlin, uh, was a time when I was doing quite a bit of research in how to notate um, the more unusual intervals from higher up in the overtone series and how to um, realize them on combinations of instruments. And I was particularly interested in the, the brass instruments. Uh, the, the piece Harry Hippie Happy is, as the title suggests, for three. Uh, in this case, the three performers are on horn, trombone, and tuba. So it's three brass instruments. And the thing that's quite special about the brass instruments is that they're often playing the harmonic overtones of different fundamentals on their long uh, tubes. So they have very low um, fundamentals, and then they can go up the overtones all the way up to 16 or 17 in the harmonic series, which are, in a way, similar to the string harmonics, which we actually just heard in the harmonium for uh, Claude Vivier. But in this case, these are the brass harmonics, and the combinations that I was interested in uh, exploring in this piece are the slightly more hairy ones, <laughs> as the title might also indicate. Um, so in this case, uh, there are kind of uh, harmonies or chords of quite, quite unusual harmonic combinations, but which still the ear can recognize as fitting together as harmonies. But the sense of the music is much less triadic or... Um, conventionally tonal in the sense that we know of consonances, but rather there are many tuned dissonances or tuned beatings. And the brass instruments are particularly interesting for these sounds because they have such a smooth and soft sound, which is very sensitive to tuning, but which allows the dissonances to make the instruments very lively in their color. Whereas, for example, the string instruments or, or many wind instruments like the oboe or bassoon are much more um, nasal in their sound quality and the combinations of high overtones are very quickly quite aggressive to hear. So um, my idea with the piece was a kind of solo for the trombone where every 10 seconds he would change his slide position and that in a kind of, in a kind of systematic way so beginning very close to his mouth and then very far away and then in the middle and then coming back to his mouth and then one third of the way, then two thirds of the way, then all the way out again and so on. So kind of moving back and forth along the slide in, in increasingly more subtle divisions. And in doing those divisions, he would keep coming back to positions where he was before. And the idea of the form of the piece was a kind of like a uh, based on the old rondo form where certain things are always returning and interrupted by new material and in this case the old material is whenever the trombone would reach a similar position of the slide and the other two instruments kind of as it were play along with these positions of the trombone uh, using all of the kind of unusual combinations of their valves to produce the microtonal pitches. I think of it as a kind of like one one crazy three-part dance in a way, so that the, they often are making the sounds together or one instrument starts and then two more join, various kinds of um, ways of breaking the chords, but basically their, their movements are a little bit like... Um, kind of a, a big clumsy dance and that was a little bit sort of one of the one of the motivations with the with the title in, in its three parts well of course the title is a double if not a triple entendre right i mean yes, it speaks volumes well there, there was just 
various things in my in my mind when I when I was writing it. I was in California for the first time. I was uh, uh, actually a, a guest teacher at the California Institute of the Arts. So of course I was uh, thinking about uh, the the atmosphere of that place being there, and I was also then thinking about uh, threes. So, for example, all the Sati pieces with three parts, and uh, also of James Tenney with his echoes of those three parts and his uh, um, um, a reference to Sati, and then, of course, to Lamont Young, who is uh, uh, sort of uh, has these wonderful, mysterious photographs with a big long beard, and uh, who was a kind of father of. Um, a certain certain kind of um, uh, extreme tuning music. He was always seeking out these very very high overtones in his work, and so uh, these various echoes that were in my mind then came to a, to a, a title which I thought was was a kind of uh, poetic echo of uh, of what I was working on. My titles often come um, late in the course of the piece being being written and they are something which then they function to kind of complete the piece they give it a, another aspect or, or raise another question in addition to the, to the sound well, that is sort of um, the, my, my general experience has been that the title comes after the composition rather than before so let's give uh, this piece a listen this is a hairy hippie happy by Mark Sabat. Uh, it's approximately eight minutes long, and we'll be back uh, shortly thereafter uh, to talk to Mark some more. Thank you. 
Thank you.
And we're back with our guest tonight, Mark Sabat, uh, talking about a range of his instrumental works. Now, I wanted to ask you to introduce uh, us to a very interesting piece uh, that incorporates text as well as poetry. This is a piece called Garden Songs. Well, that, that, this is a, um, a collaboration with uh, a friend, a visual artist, who's primarily a painter, Wolfgang Betke, and uh, in in addition to his painting, or in a way as a kind of complement or inspiration to his work, creating visual images, um, he also does text-based performances. And for many years, he did a kind of uh, radio show uh, where he would um, present short um, performative uh, texts, which he uh, wrote and uh, recorded himself. Um, and I, I got to know his work, and I was very impressed by his paintings and uh, the kind of process of um, erasure, which he uses. He uses a kind of layering of paint followed by a kind of um, scratching away or um, using power tools to take away layers and reveal other layers. And um, he showed me some of the textbooks he was working on, and one of them uh, was a piece called Hortus Conclusus, uh, so the um, which refers to uh, kind of um, an iconographic uh, closed garden, and um, is a term for also uh, referring to painting. And uh, in the in the case of this text, uh, he had sort of a very interesting way of performing it that I I found had in itself 
the Lord was really spoken text, uh, a wonderful kind of rhythmic component. It's a text in four parts, uh, which talks in a sense about um, a kind of relationship between two people, kind of at the edge of the city, um, then something which is like an, a listing of different um, different objects, and then something which is really quite almost a dramatic kind of uh, strange uh, process of self-recycling of kind of a um, uh, quite a, a, quite an aggressive third part and a fourth part which is extremely gentle and uh, and quite beautiful. I I could read an English translation of the text, but it's rather lengthy, and I I think that actually the music uh, makes makes the makes the the content in some way also clear. Um, what I want to say about it is the way in which these songs are made is not that there is a singer singing, but rather I recorded Wolfgang Betke's voice doing the voice performance which he does, and then very strictly transcribed the rhythmic language that, that he um, creates to make his, his text performance. So the rhythms, when they're notated in, in musical notation, are rather... Uh, complex, but any musician who's following the flow of the words can still understand these kind of changing time meters, like 30, a 13 pulse followed by a 7 pulse and then a, a much slower 4 and so on, but because of the flow of the words and the nature of the, the German language that it's based on, um, it was able to function as a kind of conducting score for the trio of musicians who are playing along with the voice. And they are a, um, a dobro, so a country and western instrument played with a slide tuned in a harmonic series tuning, and um, a alto flute, um, and um, a percussion. And uh, the percussion has uh, many choices about how to, um, how to choose the, the instruments. Um, so one of the things which is uh, characteristic in the piece is that the various aspects of the rhythm and intonation of the voice were analyzed by hand, and they then lead to the uh, echoes and also then the extensions or delays um, which are then played by the instrument. So sometimes a kind of melody in the voice gets repeated later by the flute or um, is echoed by the, the sliding of the dobro in a way that the speaking voice suggests a singing voice, but um, without simply just imitating the voice or following the voice, it, it allows it to kind of extend into a musical structure. So the, the kind of forms and microtonal articulations are coming directly out of the language of speech. And for that... For that reason, the piece is dedicated to two very inspiring composers who also worked in that way, Harry Parch and uh, Robert Ashley. And am I right to say that this piece uses both improvisatory elements and uh, prepared music? The actual score is strictly notated, but um, it demands a certain kind of complexity in its realization. So, for example, the dobro part has the separate notation of the plucking and the sliding and then the microtonal pitches, which then also must follow the rhythm of the voice. But since the voice is pre-recorded, it's fixed in time, it is a kind of transcribed improvisation. So in that sense, something which comes out of, let's say, an intuitive phrasing, then is uh, recreated or recomposed for um, another layer of performance. And I think that's uh, quite an interesting way to deal with it. So in this case, it's not so much that they can make choices while playing, but rather the, the difficulty of what they're doing cause, makes it quite, quite difficult to be exactly precise in, in, in following the voice. I think that, that, would, uh, that would be what, what one could uh, say is the freedom in, this, in the case of this piece. Let's listen to it now. Uh, this is Garden Songs, composed by Mark Sabat, with music about a text 
by Wolfgang Petke. A. Wir saugen die Lehre ein. Doch auch sie vermag nicht mehr, uns auszufüllen. Gleich wird es geschehen. Es wird unausweichlich geschehen. Eine Unausweichlichkeit wird eintreten. Eine Ungeheuerlichkeit. Eine ungeheure Unausweichlichkeit. Etwas, das mit Ansteckung zu tun hat. Es wird ein Anfang sein. Ein Anfang. Wir sind schon ganz löchrig. Man kann durch uns hindurchschauen. Wir haben Angst fortzufliegen. So leicht sind wir geworden. Leicht. Ausgedünnt. Wir sind ausgedünnt. Dünn. Die Haut. Papier. Die Knochen. Bruch. Dabei speisen wir gut. Wir trinken jeden Abend Wein, Bier, Whisky und Gin. Die Tafeln sind reich gedeckt. Wir essen Schweine, Rinder, Hühner, Fische, Kartoffeln, Möhren, Korn. Die feinsten Köche zaubern jeden Tag ihre schönsten Kreationen nur für uns. Doch es langweilt, es langweilt uns. Manchmal steigen wir in ein Auto und bleiben einfach sitzen. In Blumen. Sie Unterhemden mit Löchern. Wir fahren nicht. Nicht fahren. Mit der Zeit wird das Auto von herbeigewehten Blättern und Staub überzogen. Die Scheiben beschlagen von innen, milchig, undurchsichtig. Wenn wir nach Wochen ungewaschen und ohne Nahrung zu uns zu nehmen, den Wagen verlassen, die Türen knarren dann schon ein wenig, sind wir um einige Gramm schwerer geworden. Wir riechen dann. Doch vorerst wäre es hilfreich, es wäre hilfreich, hilfreich wäre es, vorerst wäre es hilfreich, Steine zu sammeln. Die müssen wir in unsere Taschen stopfen, solange sie noch nicht durchlöchert. Wir sollten uns beeilen. Der Wind. Steine in die Taschen. Ganz voll bis zum Rand. Dicke, glatte, Kiesel, trocken, klappern. Ein Gipfel, ein Tal, ein Wald, eine Wiese, ein Garten. Zimmer, ein Auto, eine Insel, ein Vogel im Käfig, eine Gefängniszelle, ein verlassener Platz in einer Stadt. Der Wind. Cabin's Baby. Roses of Sunshine. Violets of Dew. Zwei Babys. Eine Teigrolle. Ein Hammer, ein Bowie-Messer, eine Pistole, 
ein Urteil? C. Wir stehen am Rande der Stadt, auf einem verlassenen Parkplatz, auf dem außer ein zusammengefallener Bauwagen in einem hellen Blau, man sagt Bleu, ein helles, fast Himmelblau, wenn es nicht so blass wäre, oder wie an besonders heißen Sommertagen, wenn das Blau milchig wird. Meine Mutter sagte immer, bei Wäsche sagte meine Mutter immer Bleu, das ist in so einem Blö gehalten. Steht der Baumwagen in einem Blö gehalten? Warten wir auf jemanden dort oder schauen wir nur den Rissen im grünen Asphalt beim Reißen zu, wie sie sich dehnen, dehnen in der Kopf? Wenn du es nicht mehr aushältst vor lauter Verkommenheit, vor lauter Niedertracht, vor lauter Fahrigkeit der menschlichen Gesten, der menschlichen Taten, die so verdorben sind, dass du kotzen könntest, kotzen auf den heißen Asphalt, sodass deine Kotze im gleichen Moment zu verdampfen anfängt, wie sie auf die heiße Lava klatscht, in einem großen braungelben Schwall mit kleinen grünen Bröckchen vor dem Blö des Bauwagens einen Schwall in großem Bogen erbrochen und auf den Asphalt geknallt, um dort im selben Moment zu verdampfen, bevor du dich hinknien kannst, um deine Kotze wieder aufzuschlecken, weil du sonst keine Nahrung mehr zu dir nehmen wolltest, Nachdem du diese einmal produziert, wolltest du sie im Kreislauf halten, nichts Neues hinzufügen, aber auch so wenig wie möglich verlieren. Du wolltest sozusagen einen größtmöglichen Rezyklus schaffen, einen Nahrungskreislauf mit dir selber. Doch du bist zu spät gekommen. Dein Niederknie nützt dir nichts. Es verdampft noch, wie du es fallen siehst. Es verdampft. Deine Kotze verdampft. D. Himmel werden orange und Wälder blau. Ich sah das in deinem Gesicht, nachdem ich dich geküsst. Du küsstest mich wach. Unsere Lippen weichten, immer zarter, weicher und süßer. Duft nach Morgen und weiter. Wolken verfegten sich plötzlich sehr wild, Farben zerflossen mit einem Mal viel mutiger. Ein Leuchten kehrte zurück vor lauter Glück. Ein Schmelz bog ein in das Stottern der Hand. Du lächelst in mir. Der Wald fällt in die Gegend zurück. Er fließt in den Tag mit Weiß und Blau. Das Rauschen bringt Schneestücke zu Fall und grün bricht das Gras gegen die Sonne. Kleine Wassertröpfchen nehmen uns auf und gebogen lehnen wir uns hinunter zum Grashalm. Ganz in der winzigen Welt, die so glänzt, sehen wir uns in der kleinen Kugel. Lege mich wie ein Siegel auf dein Herz wie ein Siegel auf deinen Arm. So let's talk a bit about your Canadian history. Of course, presently you're based in Berlin, but your roots stretch all the way across the Atlantic. I'm sure you have many memories from Canada. If you were to pick one or two, uh, what is your favorite Canadian moment? I was born in Kitchener, and uh, I grew up uh, in New Brunswick, in Fredericton, New Brunswick. I spent a number of years living in Toronto after I finished studying. Um, and before that, I was in St. John's, Newfoundland for one year. And that was followed by one year in Montreal. And I guess the most important uh, moments for me in terms of developing the direction that I went as a composer uh, began with an encounter in the the university library of Memorial University in St. John's, Newfoundland um, at which point I was playing in a string quartet and kind of 
realizing that that's not the direction that my life was going to take. I must have been about 20 or 21 years old at the time, my early 20s. And um, uh, so I was, it was clear to me that I was going to return to um, composing or to creating music in some way as the center of, of my work. But I, I was somehow not not quite certain yet which way that would go. I just knew that I had a lot of questions. And while uh, wandering around the library, I came across uh, a book which, which poked out at me because of its title, Genesis of a Music uh, by Harry Parch. And it was one of a hundred signed copies which had been given to libraries across North America. And it was the, a remarkable book from the late 1940s in which Parch describes his kind of radical invention of a kind of a dissonant harmony which was tunable based on the overtones. And I think that was a real important starting point. It led me to um, build an adapted viola of my own, to experiment with fingerboards, to, to buy an electronic instrument and begin exploring all of the notes in between the, the semitones of the piano and to start training my ears, which um, was a real necessary step to be able to eventually compose these kind of sounds that I use. So I think that was one important moment. In Perhaps the flip side of the Canadian question is what inspired you to move to Germany? Well, um, I think after a few years in Toronto, I, I began to become quite uh, disillusioned with the city. It's really not my favorite uh, city, I have to say, although I do love the people there, uh, partly because it's such a money-oriented city and, and uh, maybe it was partly the stress of the city and various various other factors which led me to think that it was perhaps a, a good moment to try something different. And um, one of my colleagues in array music, um, uh, told me about uh, a residency in, in Stuttgart, Germany, which he suggested that I should apply for, and so I did. As it happens, the juror that year was Christian Wolf, and uh, Christian Wolf chose me along with my colleague and friend Joko Slavnic and uh, various other people from other lands, but we were the two Canadians who were uh, invited, and so I had the opportunity to go and spend a year or a year and a half living in Germany, in Stuttgart, uh, in this wonderful residency. And so that was the beginning of my uh, time here. And it was also a moment where I had sort of decided that, um, although I did enjoy playing contemporary music on my violin, I was less and less interested in, in being an interpreter of um, all sorts of repertoire, and I was becoming more and more focused on what I like to play, including my own music and some works which I recorded, uh, James Tenney of Morton Feldman, and gradually um, uh, playing less and less uh, repertoire of, of others, which which is uh, just a, in a way a matter of time. One cannot, uh, can, cannot do everything. But um, in any case, um, after spending a couple of years in Stuttgart, some some things uh, intervened in, in, in my life which made made me decide to actually try being based somewhere else. I was thinking about where to come back to in Canada and I didn't have a good answer and then in 1998 uh, through a kind of um, very um, sad circumstance both of my parents died in a very short time and I was left kind of without a um, uh, a strong family connection because my brother was already actually living in Berlin and my sister was in New York. So I kind of considered the options and I thought I would go and join my brother who was in Berlin. And that was how it started. And since then, uh, Berlin has transformed wonderfully and is, is really a great place to be an artist. Uh, as many people know, it really attracts people from the whole world right now. And so I've ended up staying here and found, found it to be a great base. But I still keep quite a connection with Canada. I mean, I will be back uh, in Banff in, at the end of January presenting my music and uh, working with the Afiara Quartet and then coming out to Victoria for a workshop um, in the in the last last days of January where I'll be uh, giving some guest lectures and uh, also 
uh, working with uh, with the musicians of the Lafayette Quartet, I hope. So um, definitely the Canadian connection uh, always keeps coming back. And well, I hope you feel absolutely welcome to drop by our studio at CITR in Vancouver anytime. Mark, I wanted to thank you uh, for so graciously agreeing to talk with us and uh, sharing your music. Thank you. And I wanted to mention that Mark uh, makes many of his works and his scores available online. If you're interested in finding out more about Mark's music, uh, please visit uh, plainsound.org. That's plain, P-L-A-I-N. Thank you. This has been a pre-recorded uh, broadcast with uh, Mark Sabat as our guest uh, for 433 uh, program dedicated to new music on CITR 101.9 FM in Vancouver. Uh, please stay tuned for Black Vinyl Project with guest live performances as part of the 24 Hours of Student Hour. It should be exciting. There's a whole bunch of people in the studio right now. They're just waiting, waiting to get on air. I hope you stay tuned uh, and I hope you enjoyed the show.